Dr. Mank, and I'm on the RDA board, and I'm the program's chair. And I welcome you all tonight to our last lecture of the material world. It's been a wonderful lecture. I hope you've gotten to enjoy them all. First, we'd like to thank the School of Architecture at Rice and Dean Sarah Whiting for their continued support and the Museum of Fine Arts for the use of this wonderful hall. But most of all, as this um, series ends, we really need to thank the staff of the Rice Design Alliance and the people who put this program together. As program chair, I'm so impressed with the people who volunteer for the RDA, and uh, they've done an incredible job. Also, we need to thank the pre-lecture reception sponsors. Uh, we always enjoy the drinks and the food before these lectures. And that was WHR Architects and E and C Engineers and Consultants. And if you look to the left uh, and look at the slides, those are the sponsors of tonight's lectures. But before I introduce the speakers, there's a few little things I need to go over. First, if you would silence your cell phones and not take any flash photos, just out of respect for the speakers and the people around you. And after the lecture, we're going to have a brief book signing uh, right outside the auditorium. John will be signing his book, Material Architecture, if you buy the book. It's wonderful, you should. And also, tonight we have a survey. It's very, very, very short. I hate surveys, but you really should fill this out because the information is strictly for the RDA. It's so that we can do better programs, but also it's for our grant applications. They really want to know the demographics of the people who come. And so it's important information for us to have for future lectures and to get money and grants. Um, an RDA staff person will be at the top of the stairs to collect the surveys uh, as you leave tonight, so please do fill it out. It won't take long at all. On November 13th is the RDA Gala, and if you haven't been, it is a lot of fun and the auction is terrific. And if you have been, I'm sure you've already gotten your tickets. And this time we are honoring longtime Harris County engineer art story. It should be wonderful. And if you want to find out more about that or more of our programs and upcoming events, go to www.ricedesignalliance.org. And so now I'd like to introduce our speaker, John Fernandez. We're so lucky to have him here tonight. Um, he's been a professor of building technology and architecture design at the Department of Architecture at MIT since 2000. And he's a practicing architecture architect and has a firm called LFA Architects. And he's been designing buildings of low energy and low material resources. He, he's mainly involved in research, and his research takes two focuses, two areas. One is building design, which is the application of non-traditional materials for the next generation of buildings. And then the second phase is more about the built environment. It, he is focusing on the enormous value of materials that are ex extracted and consumed in order for us to build what we do in our environment. The second research has led to the development of the emerging field that you might have heard of, urban metabolism. I love that name. The study of the resource that, resources that flow that are required for contemporary cities. Both of these programs are ongoing activities that he undertakes with students in the departments of architecture, civil and environmental engineering, material science and engineering, and others. Fernandez has published widely in architectural publications as well as journals of science and other engineering and scientific publications. He frequently lectures internationally on topics of materials in the built environment and urban metabolism. And in his free time, he's the director of the Building Technology Program at MIT. He's the director of the Sustainable Ener Energy System Research in Initiative at the MIT Portugal Program. He's the MIT coordinator of the Alliance for Global Sustainability. 
He's the lead faculty on the development of the architecture and sustainable design department of the new Singapore University of Technology and Design. And he's co-director of the Urban Metabolism Special Section of the International Society of Industrial Ecology. Whew. And we're so lucky to have him. He was, uh, had a fever, and he's here, and has done us a great favor to be here. He was graduated from MIT and Princeton, and so please welcome John Fernandez. Uh, thank you for that wonderfully gracious introduction. I'm afraid I'm a little tired listening to all that I'm doing. Um, all those emails that I have to send come to mind. So let me see if I can set this up. so much for joining me tonight. Um, the, this talk is, is I, I'm hoping that it really addresses this phrase, material world. Um, I'm going to do that at extreme scales. Um, as you just heard, my research agenda has been, uh, there's been a dual focus. Um, and I'll talk first about the, the materials work that I've done in the first few years at MIT. Um, uh, I've written a that book that you've seen, and, and I'm continuing with that research, really specifically materials, material assemblies. Second research agenda is at a very different scale. It's at a macroscopic urban scale, sometimes regional, sometimes even national scale. Um, and that's the urban metabolism work. I, the, the presentation tries to encompass both, so let's see how it goes. I, I want to start with two stories, though, um, to put, it, sort of put this in perspective. As you know, many of you, this is the Pantheon in Rome, um, built in 126 AD, it's 1,884 years old, um, commissioned by Marcus Agrippa. Um, the names speculated that comes from the panoply of of gods that are represented inside. Um, but what I want to focus on is that at the time of its construction, it was the largest concrete shell in, in the world. Actually, the largest structure ever imploded, um, and the the story is that the Pantheon and the Kingdom are structural cousins. Pantheon has lasted more than 1,800 years. The the Kingdom lasted all of 26 years. Um, it was built at a cost of 40 million dollars. Um, the new stadium that replaced it was built at a cost of $425 million. The demolition produced, even though it's quite well done, actually, and it produces almost like crustacean figure here, um, was, um, was responsible for 50,000 tons of debris. A lot of it was not recycled. So the, the story is that there, we're in a world where, I'm not going to complete the story just yet, or in a world where even the largest structures can be targets of this kind of material churn in our, in our economy. The second story starts from this image. This is Shenzhen, China. Anyone been there? No? Yeah? OK, so a couple. And I have a feeling in five years, it'll be like 10 times that number. Um, this is Shenzhen in 1984. So back then, it was really nothing more than a fishing village 
Um, but it was designated as the first special economic zone by Deng Xiaoping. And, and around this time, the population was estimated to be something somewhere around 20, 25,000. This is Shenzhen today. Again, 26 years later, more people live in this city than live in New York City. This is uh, estimated. Now, now this estimation has a huge error factor, but it's at least likely, at minimum, 14 million people. It has more, this city has more factories than the American Midwest, has a skyscraper taller than the Empire State Building, it's the busiest port in China. Um, it's, it's been growing at the fastest rate um, past 30 years, and in the last few years it grows at a rate of 100% per year in population. <laughs> so this is represented, the second story is representative of something that has been happening, is happening right now, will continue to happen. That's a massive urbanization of large parts of this world. China's urbanization took 22 years to increase from 40% to about, from, sorry, from 18% to about 40%. It took Britain 120 years to do that same incremental jump. The US 80 years and Japan 30 years. So we are seeing urbanization at an unprecedented rate, unprecedented historical rate. In 2030, the Chinese urban population will be approximately 1 billion people. By the way, Shenzhen is your sister city, Houston sister city. You, you have 17 sisters to your city. <laughs> you, do, you do things big here in Texas. So, um, but this is really, this is a future that I'd like to focus on partly on today. 90% um, of urbanization in the coming decades is going to happen in developing regions. And just take this into account. So 3 billion people live in cities now. 3 billion more people will live in cities. New population, 3 billion new people will be living in cities in uh, about 20, 30 years. So we will build the equivalent amount of city fabric that we have today in about 30 years. And, and as, as I said, 90% of that will be in the developing world. So, you know, this is really um, the sort of underbelly of green city discussions today. The underbelly being that for much of the developing world, the challenges have nothing to do with resource efficiency, have nothing to do with energy, really have to do with the challenges that have been there for a very long time and, and promised to maybe become more challenging in the future of poverty, uh, lack of access to critical resources, as health, education, and, and onwards. So that, that completes my two stories. Let me tell you a little bit about myself, okay, before I really get into the research that we've been doing. So I'm a, I am an architect, um, and it's, sometimes I have to remind audiences of that because my research takes me very far away from just design, just design. Um, this is one of my buildings when, when I was at the Pulse Shaker Partners in New York City. I say it's one of mine because partners were concerned with many other things and somehow I was left alone to design this thing. Uh, it's an addition to the Columbia Law School in New York City. But now my wife and I, we do quite a lot of work fo that's focused on what maybe some people call climate-oriented design or solar design. I just call good practice, really, um, siting buildings and, and configuring their volumes to respond to um, environmental forces. Um, and, and we've been producing work like this. These are two of the most recent um, projects we've done. Both of these projects are very, very low tech and very low energy. And I, I don't really have, I'm not gonna go into the details here, but both of them have full basements and they use the thermal mass of those full basements for the, and they're, they're quite small buildings. So I am a designer and I, I do feel like um, the, the work that I've done is design oriented though with a technological bend to it. Um, this is a piece of architecture that's, um, we're still negotiating getting this built. It's a float house for New Orleans and this begins to talk about the intersection between buildings and the built environment, the urban environment, and that is that in this building, this takes into account the idea that maybe there is distributed infrastructure, and the distributed infrastructure for flood protection is in the building itself. The building floats when there's a flood. The building stays up when there's a flood. 
filling these columns um, that hold it up, and and those that water gets released when the residue comes back and lowers the building, so that it prevents or makes more difficult looting of personal items. A lot of the work that I've done, I actually want to say one. Um, I didn't plug my computer in, and I'm just a little worried that it might oh. run out of yeah, yeah. juice. Okay. So, I'm going to pause here for a second. <laughs> So um, a good, so the first research agenda I want to spend some time on, because I know there are a number of students here and others, and, and the series is called Material World. Okay, now I'm, I'm all good. Um, the, there is an enormous potential in new materials, and so I've spent a good, good bit of my career looking at, in a, in a scientifically rigorous way, with design, issues in mind, uh, new materials, non-traditional materials, uh, assemblies that can be composed of non-traditional non materials. This is actually a building um, by Thomas Herzog, not the other one, um, in Munich. And it is a building that takes advantage of the high thermal resistance of aerogels, or foamed silica, and makes a translucent curtain wall, which not only has very high performance thermal performance, but also allows daylight into the building. We, I, I'm teaching a lot about this sort of thing, the way in which new materials can, can insinuate new systems and new approaches to the way that buildings not only um, perform, but also are thought of in terms of objects in time, so their, their relationship to resources. A lot of the work that I have done in the past, and this is, <coughs> this is in the book, um, pieces of this, are trying to uncover particular sets of performance functions that are not being attended to very well in buildings. And buildings, our buildings are not particularly high performing, and there are material solutions that we can apply, although I do tend to think that sometimes architects fixate a bit too much on material solutions to non-material problems. But the, these are all sorts of metals. Uh, I've worked in the laminated metals, especially polymer and metal laminations. Um, I, a lot of my work has to do with composites of different kinds. But I've also done a good bit of work in metal foam, so stabilized aluminum foam. Colleague, a uh, collaborator of mine at the University of Cambridge, Mike Ashby, the material scientist, is, is gaga over foams and has been for a long time. And so some of the work that we've done, this is photograph of showing a, la a laminated glass um, assembly using glass fibers as a structural fiber. So the idea of, so the performance function that we're aiming at here is the elimination of joints in, in glass walls and the actual literal making of curtain walls, walls that are, are suspended in tension with structural fibers that are um, laminated between st structural glass of one kind or another. We've also done a good bit of work, and we're going to start up another uh, project now on multi-layered fabric envelopes. The, one of the areas of enormous potential and enormous growth in the last 20 years has been polymer fibers, polymer fabrics um, of various kinds. You know very well the sort of consumer items of Gore-Tex and your high-performance shells for snowboarding or whatever are very high-performing. They have very interesting um, attributes to them. And bringing these sorts of materials into buildings um, is, is very much part of the work that I've done. And what that implies for. So here's where I was really very privileged to be in um, a studio today, Donna's studio today, um, the f of uh, materials work in which both the properties of materials that are unfamiliar to, to anyone, not only architects, and the performance or the design intentions uh, for contemporary architecture can, are, are, are beginning or can be matched in really interesting ways to produce really li literally original or, or new perspectives on, on buildings. But as the materials guy and the MIT materials guy, don't get me wrong, I think 
material solutions are a very, very small slice of the larger design, architectural design project. Some of the work that, actually I spent a few years on this work, and um, this is natural fiber reinforced concrete. We're now introducing it um, in a variety of places. The World Bank's taken this on to, to see how widespread and how useful a moderate tensile reinforcing for concrete, um, how that could be used around the world. The main, main problem of steel reinforced concrete in the developing world, especially in seismic zones in the developing world, is that um, you can have the best building codes in the world, but um, enforcement of building standards, construction standards on site, and the wholesale removal and widespread removal of structural steel, <laughs> reinforcing steel bars from concrete is, is, is endemic, it's widespread, and that's why buildings, concrete buildings collapse. So the idea here is, well, there are some interesting, the largest material waste stream in the world, which is underutilized, so the largest um, and, and everywhere is, is agricultural waste products. Of those waste products, many, many interesting, mechanically interesting fibers can be found, and so a concrete that can take advantage of a small fiber that's included in, in inserted in the in the wet matrix, and then gives it a moderate strength is of value because the building will crack and it will shake, but it won't collapse in, in the way that a completely unreinforced structural frame will. And so part of this work, and, and again, I'm showing this partly because it's material world, so let's say, but also because this, this did really begin to focus me on this project in particular, especially when I realized and got deeper into the enormous uh, issue of agricultural waste products around the world. So I made a number of different visits to, to huge plantations, was in Venezuela at a coconut farm, um, spent some time in Vietnam, um, and in, in these places, the 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 material waste is just extraordinary. And so the m potential for using natural fibers, which you can find everywhere, um, is, is interesting to me. But it really brought to mind what are the larger flows that architecture and the built environment require and tap into. And so that started, that started to insinuate for me, maybe there's, there was a bit of a hunch for me that maybe there's some work to be done on a larger scale. But before I did that, finished up some of the the, the work, um, and I mean, if you're interested in more detail, um, so I wrote this article for for Science Magazine, um, and it really is an article that the, the the primary intention of this article is to match architects, what architects think about and what they do, with what material scientists think about and what they do. So it uses the language of both fields and tries to match them up. Some interesting things have come about because of this article. I mean, one interesting thing is that companies have, have sort of tripped over themselves to try to get me to sign non-disclosure agreements and be a consultant, which is good and fine and all that. But um, some other thing, material science departments um, uh, have, have kind of woken up to the idea that the built environment is a place maybe where they might want to focus some of their attention. And that's an important thing. The, the, besides the book, the other culminating product was a material selector that I worked with um, very much in collaboration with Mike Ashby at the University of Cambridge. Um, Mike has made his career on multi-objective optimization in material selection. And he did this for the purpose of um, assisting mostly engineers in material selection in, in fields like mechanical engineering and aero-astro. Uh, but he told me a few years ago, when we started this project, that the inquiries that he was, the, the, the greatest volume of inquiries that he was getting from, from people in different disciplines about materials, how to select materials, was coming from the built environment, civil engineers and architects. Because architects are, to some extent, still substantially in charge of specifying the materials of buildings, but they have no rigor no, there's no rigorous process in the selection of materials. Um, so maybe we can debate that issue because maybe some of you disagree. But um, there is no rigorous 
methodology in the way that one would say, you know, the mechanical engineer will compare the material indices of strength and stiffness with thermal, you know, diffusivity or any of that. So this is a tool, it's actually a piece of software that takes, I think we now have, I think we have 80,000 materials, but it puts it in the, the framework of what an architect would do. So the references are built, the buildings, um, the, the mechanical properties are all, technically it's all, it's all there, but descriptions um, relate to how the architect thinks about it. And, and we included a lot of materials that, that were materials and, and composites that had not been included before, things like um, aerated concrete, um, soda, soda lime glass as a, as a material. The other thing that this tool is really useful for, I've, I have found that my students, um, I run a number of workshops in, I have in the past that, um, that address not only the traditional, the standard material properties like, like strength and, and density, but also begin to address eco-properties, or so-called eco-properties. So how do you begin to compare production energy, which is this, which is the x-axis here. So production energy, uh, you know, another word for really embodied energy, uh, with the carbon dioxide per kilogram of material. So here's the thing that for designers, what's really useful to know are some broad uh, correlations. So if I know that production energy and carbon dioxide emissions are really closely correlated, I'm going to know that basically I'm going to get like a 45 degree angle here um, in the grouping of the material. So basically everything's going to follow that line. So that's my interest in the enhancement of knowledge and material selection for designers or for designers to be able to make that correlation and understand that. Not to know exactly what the production energy of any particular piece of, any, any particular material is, because that, that's not important. The other thing that's important is to put it on a relative scale. So that if I am making a, a selection between three or four different materials, I know where they fall on this scale, so I don't need to really know any more than that. So that's the second product, main product that came out of the first, um, area of research that I've spent my time. So let's jump to scale now. So this is a photograph in Chicago. And it, is, it is actually a photograph um, taken um, when I was in Chicago at about the time when I started to focus in on um, a macroscopic view, um, an urban and regional view of material. So the, the simplest way for me to put this is the most straightforward way is to say up until now these were materials and material performance and I was interested. Now I'm really interested in materials in time. So what happens to materials in time? They flow. They are in one place, they're extracted, they're processed, they're manufactured, they're used, they're, they're dispersed. Um, and so my real interest here was beginning to think about materials in time. And when you do that, then you start to think really much at a much larger scale about the, about the built environment. So let me tell you another story. So there's a book that came out rec very recently called Manahata. Manahata. It's apparently the Indian name in which Manhattan was derived. A book by Eric Sanderson. Um, there was also an exhibit uh, at the <coughs> Museum of the City of New York. I think it was. Um, it's quite a beautiful, wonderful book. And it really has one, well, it has multiple purposes, but its, it's primary intention is to say, well, what was Manhattan before it was Manhattan? What was it like? So it's kind of like Shenzhen before, before today. And so this is a look backwards. This is speculation. And this is actually computer image, um, computer visualization of the same part of Manhattan that we have today, the urban, dense urban. And of course, you know, that happened in a period of you know, more than 150 years. So. So, that, so this is a much, obviously much slower group. And this got me, and this, it's really, if you don't know that book, it's, it's worth picking up, it's really interesting. This got me thinking about the way that we have settled the earth and its environment. And I love this image because it essentially gives you uninhabitable and habitable zones of the earth. Um, this, um, and, that, and that took me back to thinking about urban settlements. And so, the basic question that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the second research area is what are the resource requirements for urban zones, for urban spaces? 
how much do we use, why do we use it the way we use it. Um, part of this work has, has been to ask how have urban zones in the past used materials. So this is a Neolithic village, um, approximately 9500 BC. Um, you know, the, back then, there was very little trade. A uh, number of Neolithic villages um, have been studied in very great detail. And it's pretty clear that these villages were ecological disaster zones. Right? So when we talk about some, you know, some romantic past about living with nature, actually what happened was these guys would settle here, they totally destroyed the surrounding area, they, they you know, cut down all the trees, they um, basically um, disperse their wastes pretty much where they were living. Um, they would hunt the area to decimate the local population, and then they'd move on, right? So I, I know I'm simplifying, I'm sure there's maybe experts in the audience that'll challenge me, but that's okay. Um, the fact is that this was a little bit the norm before international trade because the only resources you had were what were available very locally. Um, this is an, an image that begins to um, indicate the next stage of urbanization. And really, urbanization, as we, the, the phenomena of, of urbanization, is driven by trade, international trade. So you'll find urban economists, e urban economists saying the same sort of thing. So at the, in 2500 BC, um, along waterways, which tended to be the, tr the trade routes, you find the first urban settlements. Those urban settlements were, were fairly loosely connected, but they were connected. And urban zones exploded, began to explode at about this time, and then really took off with the Roman Empire and the, the creation of a, a road network. I'm focusing in on, on Europe only just for no, for no good reason, just to show you some examples. Part of the work that came out of thinking about the initiation of urbanization and the real drivers for urbanization took us to a city, an ancient city in Peru, um, pretty recently, and we've been working on this project for about a year. So this is where you know part of my work totally departs from my background from being an architect. But this is this is a Caral, Peru. Um, it's a city founded really much before the wars of conquest by the Spaniards. It's a late archaic pre-ceramic period city about 4,000 years ago. Um, it was the earliest complex society in the New World. It's now purported to be by m many um, experts as the largest, oldest city in the New World. Um, we visited there because we were interested in the, this question. If a sustainable city is, um, or if a green city reduces its use of fossil fuels, what were cities like before fossil fuels? What, 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 what were they, you know, what was the resource intensity before we even had fossil fuels? Kind of a sort of sim simple, simplistic question to ask. But, so we studied this, there's a, there's a Peruvian archeologist who's really wonderful, um, Ruth Shady, who discovered this place. And it's a, about 142 kilometers North northwest of Lima. If you do get a chance ever, um, it's well worth it. It's very very lightly visited. It's not well known. It's it's enormous. Um, it's a beautiful beautiful valley. It's the Supa Valley, um, and did a study in which we basically um, tried to establish what was the per capita resource consumption of a resident of Caral, Peru. So you're thinking this is crazy. How could we even know? This is pure speculation. Well, actually, I'll just tell you now that it's much more difficult for us to establish the resource consumption of a person in a contemporary city than it is in an ancient city. One, the economy was vastly smaller and less diverse. Two, uh, that's, this is what archaeologists do, do when they study a place very, very well. They, they are describing the economy. So we, we really were just piggybacking on Ruth Shady's work, taking her data, and, and essentially producing an urban metabolism model I'll define what that is later, but basically understanding what the inputs were to this city, how it was transformed. So this is essentially the economy of this city 
This is the center of the city, the ceremonial center of the city. Housing was very, um, it was strictly hierarchical. There were only three, maybe four different housing types. And, and the house you got was dependent on your status in society. The economy was essentially a mixture of agricultural in the Supe Valley that you see there, this, this valley here. And interestingly enough, there's a city, really just a town, just about here, which takes advantage of this agricultural valley and is about the same size as what that city is. It's a smaller, actually. But, um, but we, we took the data, the archaeological data, and um, basically established that a per capita um, resource consumption, resource consumption per capita in bulk volume, so this is just putting everything in a basket for a resident, was about 8, 0.8, 0 .8 tons per capita per year. That's all the food, all the construction material, all the, the fuel, um, and everything. So Canal Peru, um, in a proportional way, I'm going to upfront some of my, some of our findings, was 0 0.8 per capita, 0 0.8 tons per capita. Lisbon, Portugal today, which is a city in a transition economy, people consume about 25 tons per capita. And Singapore, um, northern European cities, despite being very interested in green, a uh, number of American cities, uh, per capita consumption is upwards of 50 to 60 tons per capita. So we're talking about, so this is, this is what I meant by, well, maybe it'd be interesting to look at an ancient city. What's the comparison? I think within you know, some reasonable range of error, I think I'm pretty confident to say, you know, it's between one and, it's between 30 and 50 times. Today's urban dweller has that, that intensity of, of resource consumption compared to a pre-fossil fuel um, resident of this particular city. And that's, that's the place itself. Um, you know, it was quite, a, quite an amazing place. And again, this is to place into a larger intellectual framework the idea of what is a green city, what is a sustainable city. I'm, I hate to use the word sustainable. And so what is a resource efficient city? So how is it? One of the ways to get at that is how resource intensive is it? So here's another uh, benchmark set of numbers. This comes from a paper um, from Friedling Crossman. Um, and this basically makes the argument that, so if you look at economies and cities in terms of socio-metabolic regimes, there have been essentially three socio-metabolic regimes, a hunter-gatherer socio-metabolic regime. There's been an agricultural socio-metabolic regime, and the socio-metabolic regime just refers to the primary resource flows of that society, and then an industrial socio-metabolic regime. So the question is, is the green movement, is the idea of the post-industrial economy, is that really another socio-metabolic regime, or are we just kind of being more resource efficient, but in the same, in the same mode? Um, basically, Friedlin, the, the number that's useful here, is an ag agrarian socio-metabolic region, so direct, so material use, direct material consumption per capita, in tons per capita per year, so that is the same number that I was using for, for Caral and for Lisbon and, and Singapore, three to six or so, and then for the industrial, 15 to 25. And I think this is, these, are, these numbers are, are from, from what I've done, my work, own work, these are pretty solid, although I'd say for many, many cities in the developed world, this is much, much higher, it's upwards of, 15, 75, even 80. Um, and so the factor here is many, many times, maybe six, seven, eight times. Okay, let me take you through a little bit of. Oops. Let me take you through a little bit of uh, some population dynamics very quickly, uh, just to put in perspective again. So, population dynamics. <laughs> Uh, from year one, uh, this is, so the areas of the country are proportional, it's the proportion of population, of world population for that land mass, right? So um, back in year one, China and India were huge, right? They, they had a huge proportion of the, um, of the population. Notice that Peru's pretty big. This is, these are the Incas, the Aztecs, right? 
very little, very little in what we now call the United States. In 1500, uh, this is at about, this is just right after the Spanish and um, arriving in South America. Um, you know, the region, the region with the largest population, the proportion of population is still, but now Africa is a little bigger, Northern Europe is, is expanding, the Aztecs. After the Spaniards decimated the population of Peru, in proportion of that population, and literally because of that, and, and then North America is growing bigger, so this is, this is the colony in the United States, and then, not colony, after the colony, so this is in Europe and China. So China and India have always been an enormous proportion of population. 1960, and in the spring of 2000, the world population reached 6 billion, um, and China, China, India, and Japan still have an enormous proportion, and now Brazil is is getting much larger. 2050, the estimated Earth's population will be somewhere around nine, a little over nine billion. 62% um, of people will live in Africa, Southern Asia, and Eastern Asia. And by 2300, so anyone confident enough to predict that far into the future, this is a, by courtesy of worldmapper.org. Um, pretty interesting work on that site. Uh, the, the population is expected to rise between 2050 and 2300, and then decline to about 9 billion. So it's going to level off at 9 billion. Uh, it's fairly, fairly strong numbers, I think. So putting, in, putting it into perspective, 1 to 2 billion, 2023 20, years, 2 to 3, 3 years, 5 to 6 billion, 12 years is what it took. Um, and, and again, these are, so if we reach 10 billion, it will take that amount of time. If we do, and then it will go down. How is this relevant? This all hopefully puts into a historical and global perspective the, ur the massive urbanization of, world, of global populations. And that is that in somewhere around 2008, it'd be wonderful to know exactly when, but it's totally impossible, 50% uh, of the world became urban. So more than half the world Start lived in cities and will continue to live in cities. So the urban population will overtake the rural population from now on, um, and it'll be so, it'll reach somewhere around 62, 65 percent, depending on what scenarios you 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 believe. Uh, the United States reached that more than half of the population urban early in the in the 20th century, and. Putting into perspective now, just the 20th century, what does that urbanization mean? So urbanization and the built environment are very good indicators of resource intensity. So in 1900 per capita, sorry, 1900 in total numbers, we extracted from the earth construction of minerals, ores, fossil fuel, and biomass at a rate of 7.4 gigatons per year. By the end of the 20th century, that turned into almost 60 gigatons per year. And the mix changed. So the mix changed from a lot of biomass, which, again, proportionally, you see that the biomass is it's going down, but proportionally it's getting much, much smaller. A great deal of construction material. So as an architect, as a building professional, if you take anything away from my talk, it's to take away the fact that material throughput that's dedicated to the built environment is the largest material throughput that there is in any economic sector. It's, it's absolutely enormous. It dwarfs every other economic sector. Ores in industrial minerals and then fossil fuel energy carriers, obviously there was a growth, growth in that. So that, bear with me here. I don't, I don't have many slides with a lot of text, but I do want to focus in on this one. This is that the global population during the 20th century quadrupled 6.4 billion. But at the same time, GDP grew by 20-fold, 20 times. So the, in addition to that, the total material extraction, so all the materials in bulk that we extracted increased by eight times, and totally, as I just said, about 59 gigatons in 2005, and the strongest increase was in construction. So therefore, if we, if we define the material intensity of society, so the material intensity is the direct material consumption cell, the amount of materials that consumed 
divided by GDP. So divided by the incremental financial gain. Um, that we can say, I'm going to skip to this, that the material intensity of 2000 was, was, was only 40% of the material intensity of 1900. So we're actually more material efficient for every dollar of GDP that we, that we generate. Now you can have a debate on whether GDP is the appropriate number or appropriate measure of financial um, health. But the population growth also, and this is an interesting one, the population growth was much smaller than the growth in the direct material consumption. So we actually did consume much, much more materials per capita, but that was dwarfed by the increase in GDP. So we've become wealthier, we've become, in absolute numbers, much more material consumptive. And this, this is not an insignificant fact that a significant shift from biomass, renewable, therefore, materials to not to non-renewable materials and minerals and metals occurred during the 20th century. So, some, so let me put this a little bit in concrete terms. So there's a, a fellow at uh, the Yale School of Forestry and the Environment, uh, Tom Gradle, that I've done some work with, and we, we, we do a lot of, we talk a lot, actually. Um, he's published a lot in the Proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences. And he's determined, he's done a big study on where metals are. So if you just ask yourself the question, we have a limited number of metals on Earth, where are they right now? He's done a study now of all the primary metals. And he's determined in very general terms, this applies to most primary metals, that one-third of metals, so let's say copper, one-third of that copper is left in the ground today. It's in the ground in low-grade ores. So most of the high-grade ores have been extracted, mined. That's why today you have several dozen companies, and a couple that have contacted me, and many of those are, are Chinese-based, that are looking at mining the ocean floor. It's one of the places where there hasn't been a lot of mining. And those are very low-grade ores. The second third is in circulation. So they're in our buildings, plumbing, they're in uh, automobiles, they're in devices. Um, and it's interesting, in circulation, so in buildings, if you, anybody know what midnight plumbers are? So this is the, this is the uh, phenomena of when commodity prices for, for metals like copper, zinc and others, um, go, go above a certain level. I think for copper it was two, two dollars a pound, I believe it was. Uh, you get a whole lot of um, scavenging plumbing from unoccupied buildings. Uh, in New Orleans, did a lot of work there. Uh, the aftermath of that was that a lot of buildings were destroyed because people were scavenging, and commodity prices at that time were quite high. So, and a third are pretty much lost forever. And this is through processing, through dispersion, through landfilling, you know, to places that are really, really hard to get at, or environmentally, they've just been dispersed. So, you know, this is entropy, right? This is at work. So, he, so Tom has produced a number of um, alluring graphics. This is one of Beijing. Um, this is the, this is copper in Beijing, um, and, and in fact, this is not. These are not buildings. This is actually um, percentages, intensities of copper, to be found in the city of Beijing. So he's pretty much mapped a good part of the city, um, went into. These are almost all. This is all buildings, really. This is where the copper is found, and so that he's finding that the highest grade ores now are to be found in the largest cities in the world. That's where we're really going to, um, that's where we're really finding the majority we will find, we will use, um, and extract the majority of the, of the metals that we'll be using for, um, in the future. And so there's a quote that I'd love to get back to, love Jane Jacobs' work, um, not referred to often these days, but in her economy of cities, so she, she made a very pressing statement here that our cities are the minds of the future, and even though they're, that she was saying this in a slightly different way. I think this is prescient because there, there is no question that the, intense, the, the concentration of, of materials like minerals and metals in our cities is, is changing the material flows um, and changing the way we think about resources. So that led to the second research area. I've been going on for 43 minutes and 32 seconds. So. I think I have a little bit of time. 
So urban metabolism is the study, this comes from Tom Grail, and I'm just adop adapting it here, or adopting it here, it is the study of flows of resources in the urban technological environment, so in the urban economy, um, and of the influences, so of economic, political, regulatory, on the transformation of those resources. So we've set up a group in the Society for Industrial Ecology, International Society for Industrial Ecology, on sustainable urban systems. So the point of this work is, I told you before, is to account for physical, the, the physical requirements of urban spaces. But the, the associated target of this research is to answer the question, how resource intensive are, are our cities? So that we can answer the question that everyone's trying to answer, and that is how green can they be? So I think I can say in general terms that most green city plans, even pretty well thought out, mature green city plans um, in Europe, um, uh, even in Japan, uh, tend to just grab at the, 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 the um, articulate targets that just come out of thin air. So a 20% reduction in carbon emissions in 2030 is just a very nice round number that people pick because it's nice and round, right? easy to remember. So the idea here is to give a much better, much more, much deeper, much more scientifically sound basis for trying to understand what the potential for sustainability or for resource efficiency in the city is. Um, and this is work of uh, Nancy Grimm. She's, a, she's an ecologist and she's spent some time. So the urban metabolism field, the people who call themselves urban metabolists number about two dozen. Uh, I had them all at MIT this January. And we had a two-day workshop. And out of that came some very interesting thoughts about how we can advance this, this field. Working off of diagrams like this, which talk about the human drivers in relation to environmental changes, and then cross-scale influences the urban socio-ecosystem socio along with the things like um, policy that's applied to cities um, and, and drivers, which are the economic drivers or motivations for development in cities. This is, as I said, in the context of an enormous proliferation of green city initiatives. So if you do a search, and I started out doing this one afternoon to say, okay, what, what's every sustainable city green building, but mostly sustainable city project, initiative that's out there, and, and, and especially those with targets, and it turned into a three-day project of surfing the net. Um, there really are literally, I would say probably three to 500 of these out there. Uh, you may know that during the past 15 years, the, the Council of Mayors of the United States um, has really taken on sustainability. And, that, and, the, and the, the notion that cities are actually at the center of greens, green society, or the movement towards green, a green economy, which I'm very skeptical of, but the fact that cities are in, in the center of that means that they, they go ahead and they do these things. See? And uh, literally, I had it from many mayors and other municipal government authorities. So I asked them, so how'd you come up with your green plan? They said, well, well, we had an intern for the summer. And the person, um, <laughs> we, we put them in a the corner, and they just kind of did their thing. And then at the end of the summer, we thought, well, this is great. Published, right? Wow. And, and that's the target, and those targets and of course, you know, of course, the mayor comes in at the last minute or somewhere in between and says, no, 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 it's got to be 2030, not 2050. 2050 is way out. It's got to be 20. So, you know, things like that. So that's the reality of these green city plans. So the worry that I have is that not, not only do we have targets that are coming from nowhere, but we're also potentially spending enormous resources, effort, time, energy, intellectual energy on the wrong thing. Um, and that is in the developed countries where we have service or close to predominantly service economies that are fairly resource efficient to begin with. And the main issues in cities today, globally, um, are you know <laughs> much more intense, much more critical than whether or not 
um, you know, you've got the electric car charging stations, you know, at appropriate points in the downtown area of Copenhagen. So that's that's another one of my worries. So that, that it, so it led it's led to starting very slowly, and very small. This is a student, uh, an MR actually. Um, in 2007, he finished his work. He started in about 2005, and this is a material flow analysis of the MIT campus. This is basically uh, everything that's brought in, how it, where it goes, what it's used. He he did have some um, recommendations at the end of this. Oh, a couple of them were, in, were were acted on. One was that there's a lot of cooking fuel, the, the cooking oil that's used, and and they're out of that spring some projects that reuse that cooking fuel for for energy. And then there, um, the reclamation of more construction waste than the MIT can. So you know maybe it's not maybe it's not the a huge savings in resources. But what it did was doing something like this meant that the the eggheads at MIT, all the way up to the higher authorities, see something like this and they say, oh, okay, now I can kind of understand what you're talking about um, and I can kind of get my head around some target or at least some action. Um, also, around the same time that Tom started his work, we were doing work in New Orleans. Um, we, were, we went in and actually were asked to do, by uh, the Office of Recovery Management, uh, uh, a system dynamics model. So part of this work, I won't get into it, but part of the work is very much all about system dynamics. If you know Jay Forrester at MIT started system dynamics work um, in the late 50s, 60s at MIT. Um, he got smacked down for some of the conclusions that he, he arrived at that, that kind of ruffled the, the disciplinary feathers of the planners at the time. And, but but the work in system dynamics is something that we use. So that is how do you relate all the um, actors and forces in a complex system with one another, hopefully in a mathematical way to arrive at some some basis for making uh, policy. And we and this is, is to me this is interesting that now in, in New Orleans this Green Nola plan wasn't the intern that they happened to come into their office, but it was two of our graduate students who were in a corner doing things by themselves and sometimes didn't even tell me what they were doing. So, but they, they wrote this plan up and it's been adopted and, and I think it's better because it takes some of the work that we had started at the time and puts it within a perspective, first of all, resource efficiency, not sustainability. And that's led to the work that I'm doing today. So, um, I'm at 51 minutes, so I think a good time. The work that we're doing today is to, um, we've, we've had to regress into abstractions um, to begin with. And so we're abstracting the, book of the, the urban space. And part of this has been, this is done very much with urban economics in mind. So I had to crash course on urban economics and pretty intense field. But urban economics defines an urban zone um, as composed of essentially three elements, transportation, and, and, and urban zones will happen be, to, to reduce the cost of transportation. Um, built environment, so housing mostly, but the built environment generally, and then goods and services, the transaction between firms and workers, employment and, and income and all that sort of stuff. So the way we, so this is, a, this is really just a kind of more like an icon of the built environment, transportation, goods and services are embedded in here, and then the natural environment. So uh, you might know that one of the, one of the challenges to sustainability in the, for cities are that many, many of our largest cities, um, at least in the developed world, are already in place. Right? So I'm not going to move them. Where, why did they get established where they are? Well, some of them because of water trade routes. Right? Well, one path towards sustainability is to reclaim those trade routes, the water trade routes, waterways, canals in the Midwest, that's where, so there's some, some reasons to, to look at why those cities were settled where they were when fossil fuels were much more expensive. But we also do work in um, another, the, the other part to this approach is taking individual households and there, there's a lot of work in characterizing the consumption of individual actors and individual agents, characterizing their 
the trajectory of the resource consumption over time, and translating that into some. Now, at, this, at the time these graphics were made, the greenhouse gases was our, was our unifying metric. And air, water, energy, and materials, input into a system boundary, which is the metropolitan area, different households placed in different places, um, in the context of the both environment, transportation, and goods and services, produce an overall greenhouse gas emission. So it starts to get mathematical, and, and I, um, to be honest, this is where my graduate students kind of take over. Uh, I know what they're doing, but I don't really get to, and this is where it can become, starts to become very multidisciplinary. That is where the summation of the, of the resource intensity of the built environment has to do with the intensity of the, so the, that's intensity of the of air, water, energy, materials, that's the point of the built environment, uh, industry, transport, industry is the proxy for goods and services. So we've done this for uh, a few cities. We've done it for Boston, Lisbon, uh, we've done it for Caral. Peru. Um, we're doing it right now for Singapore. I'll show that work in a second. And this, this leads to a material matrix which base, basically then becomes a material flow analysis model. And the material flow analysis model takes all the imports, places them within the urban economy, and then accounts for the exports. And we get to figures like this. So now, if a city is interested in being more material efficient or closing material cycles, you can say, well, this is the volume of material that attends to these different sectors of the urban economy. Therefore, we can go maybe to a certain level, but beyond that, we can't because the economy, the way it is right now, demands that level of material input. So there are limits to sustainability. So that's, that's part of this. This work, and we get we get actual numbers. So the direct material consumption of Lisbon and then Portugal, Lisbon for a very very broad classification of materials, um, and this is kind of our master diagram. So I spent a year in Lisbon uh, two years ago doing this work with a with a partner, uh, Paulo Ferral, who's with the Instituto Superior Técnico, which is basically uh, Portugal's MIT, and this is our master diagram, which is taking the Eurostat material flow analysis diagram and saying, if we can account for all imports active, so these are driven by the economy, so water, energy, materials, biomass, and regional hidden flows. So Lisbon's a port, so some of these flows just pass right through the economy. Um, and there's, min there's, min there's extraction from the urban zone itself, very little usually. There's some municipal hidden flows inside. And then here are the three urban activities, the sort of meta activities or meta groupings, which are goods and services, the built environment, and infrastructure and transportation. And we can now, um, for the cities we're working on, and hopefully many, many more in the future, we can, we can assign a resource intensity for goods and services and then break this out into lots of different kinds of goods and services. So now also, actually, what you can do is you can begin to have a discussion with different economic sectors within the city and say, what are you going to contribute to urban sustainability or resource efficiency, given the fact that your industry right now is, requires this level of material input? And then we have the active output, water, energy, materials, and biomass, and ex exported municipal waste. Obviously, you know, closing material loops, one of the things to do is to take some of this and recirculate it into these sectors. And then above this, this uh, area, the shaded area, this is a socio-environmental interface. This is a really interesting part of the urban metabolism and urban ecology that I'm not working on so much right now. There are others that are working on what is the effect of the natural ecology, or what is the, what is the interface with the natural ecology, not only in, within the city space, but, but within the region. And so you have things like biogeochemical context, so the carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and water cycles. And there are things, there, there is research now showing that there's an enormous intensity of concentration of phosphorus in cities. And nobody really knows where it goes. Um, it's, it's kind of a big mystery right now. So, in, so, so, so this is a slice of some of this work. One of the things that we know very well, and I'll show you just some of the analytical uh, visualizations that we produce. Some of the work here shows very clearly that, you know, well, we know this very well. Shanghai is quite dense, becoming less dense. Um, and Atlanta is quite spread out, as is Houston. And 
obviously there's a, there's, a, there's a relationship between the spatial structure and the effectiveness of public transportation. There's another graph which says, what's the energy intensity of transportation in these cities? And it would be a very similar curve, very high energy intensity for, for less than cities. So nothing new there. But we went ahead and, and said, well, let's look at this a little in a little bit more detail. So this is the population density of the United States. And you can see all the urban centers. That's Atlanta. So you get this kind of visualization, which um, comes mostly out of geographic information systems work um, of my um, students. And you get the, the very, very classic, very uh, abstracted uh, population density. And I, I have a, one that's very, that's, that's very precise and, and finally resolved. But this, was, this is good enough. Because mostly what we talk about when we talk about resource-efficient cities is density. So some very, very broad terms, density, um, transportation, public transportation, uh, transportation networks. And there is you know, clearly a population density versus a radius away from the city center. There is, in all cities, more or less a fairly standard curve. That, and that's Atlanta there. So they, they all congregate around, you know, around that area. But the thing that's come onto the landscape for, for urban and well, neighborhood community sustainability is services. So if you know the lead new community uh, criteria, it talks about walking distances on ICLE, which is a, another organization interested in, in urban systems, talk a lot about services. And so we decided to also use services. So the frequency of visits per week to these things um, so if you're, in, if you're trying to account for all the transportation, also the resource intensity of doing the stuff you need to do every day, then you need to account for what services, what, what is it that you're actually accessing. Um, and these are just a short list of services. And this is actually density of services in Atlanta. So when we take the population density and we take these services, um, we can take, well, we, first of all, we've got a distance, so it, uh, not so obviously, as population decreases in, in density, the, the services, the distance to services also decrease, increases, right? So I have less grocery stores out in the urbs than I do center city for many cities, um, except maybe parts of the city. Um, and so you do get this kind of graph, the distance to services. And what we're finding is that there are, I'll just jump to the conclusion here, that there is no way you get resource efficient city living in the center. Why is that? Because you have a spike in affluence in the center. You have very wealthy people, generally. And very wealthy people consume a lot. Feel very guilty, but still consume a lot. <laughs> out in out in the out, out in the edges, you get um, you know, huge distances to services. No question about that, and that's not good. So you do get you know, that's resource intensive as well. There's some sweet spot right in here, which is the sort of urban signature that we're after, that gives us a a holistic, multi multi dimensional, economically viable urban fabric that is that is resource efficient, not sustainable. No city's ever been sustainable from the Neolithic. Nothing's been sustainable, but but resource efficient. And so this is now the compilation of this is the um, total miles traveled to all the services for residents. Living somebody living in here travels that that level that much. And it's interesting because yes, the peripheries are high. There are some real dips. These are highways, right? So if I'm on a, I can generally there'll be stuff congregated around transportation corridors. That's that's a transportation corridor. That's true. But they're right in here. This sort of this sort of density of um, you know moderate travel to services to get the things that you get done. That for me is the, the beginning of a, a better visualization for urban sustainability. So we're doing some work. I'm at one hour three minutes, so I'll just finish. Um, Singapore. So we're doing work in Singapore. We've been asked to do the urban metabolism of Singapore, literally to do inputs outputs how it's transformed on the island. Singapore is interesting because the, there are two major challenges to contemporary urban metabolism studies. The first is that how do you draw your system boundary? Where do you define the city? And political boundaries are not 
good and not, not very good. So you, you know, there's usually population density boundaries, but it's messy. But it's easy with an island. You know? So the, island, the, the system boundary of this city-state is the, the boundary of that island. The, the second challenge is data. So data is always, I mentioned it before, much, much more difficult to understand the resource intensity of, of contemporary living than it is ancient living, strangely enough. The physical flows that attend to Singapore have gone from, as you can see here, between 1962 and 2003, GDP expanded in Singapore. So Singapore is a very special case. It's a wild place um, on many different levels. GDP expanded by a factor of 20. The population in that time expanded from 1.75 million to 4 million. So here's the figure that blows me away. GDP per capita rose during that period from 20% 20, 20 below world average to more than three times world average. So it's a very affluent place now. It is an ideal scenario for, for studying the island city state as a distinct system. And this is uh, from a paper uh, from Schuler. First name. But this shows you the sort of intensity of, of resource imports. The main increases have been in fossil fuels and construction materials. Singapore also just happens to be the third largest refinery location in the world for Malaysian and Indonesian oil. So all of this passed through. This is import and export. These are these are exports. So this is you know fossil fuel and other materials. Biomass, uh, yeah, fossil fuel um, exports, refined fossil fuels. And biomass stayed very low, but you can see construction minerals increased dramatically, especially you know just in the last 15, 20 years. If you if you traveled to Singapore 15 years ago and you travel today, you really wouldn't recognize it. It's a completely different place. The Switzerland of, of Southeast Asia, apparently, it's called. Um, and so we're doing this this kind of study. We're we're just at the beginning. We've got some some beginning data. I have a group of about eight students, and in about six months, we'll have a model, a, a dynamic model. So it'll, it'll show you, basically be able to cover, it'll be able to reproduce this historic, these historical trends given population affluence and technologies used for like transportation in different buildings as well. And um, the domestic material consumption is um, defined by inputs, plus exports minus outputs, right? so inputs, minus extraction. So this is a very simple diagram that we're working off of. And the direct material consumption of mobility, um, the built so transportation to both environment, goods and services gives us that total. And the Singaporeans are really, the government, is, so it's kind of like Singapore Incorporated, right, is really efficient at getting stuff done. So we're completely, aware that our findings will be applied as soon as possible because they're doing they're projecting things like this. So this is the population's four million as I said they their their goal is six million. So I want to end with this last slide just to, to repeat a couple of images. Um, and I want to do that first by thanking the Rice Design Alliance. Um, I especially want to thank Catherine Fostek who shuttled me around. Um, and hopefully didn't get sick, um, catch my catch my cold, um, Professor Kachmar, for your, for your visit today. But a few last thoughts. Um, I'm, despite the challenges that I've outlined, and I'm, I hope this has been at least informative on some level. Um, I, I'm very much an optimist because not only are we in a world of unlimited resources, but we're very much in a world of we're in a world of limited resources. Uh, but we're very much in a world also where a species of unlimited ingenuity. I think we've shown that time, time again. But it really is, if, if you come away with a second message from me tonight, that I think the designers are front and center. Um, engineers as well, but I mean really, I'm speaking to designers because I think designers need to be better informed and they really need to step up. They have to be more proactive and engaged in the state of res global resources, because we are in a world of global trade. So if you look at any materials in building this design today, you'll find that it's an extremely international mix of products and materials. 
Because designers today, really, we really bizarre, we really decide the nature of our material world, and we do leave behind not only as individuals who leave behind financial assets, which we all strive for in our 401ks and all that, and we also leave behind our intellectual legacies. But let's focus on the fact that we also leave behind the material world that you and I have shaped. Thank you.